Hello everyone. We are back with another episode of Computer Vision Talks, and this time we are going to discuss PAWS or PAWS, which is a paper discussing the semi-supervised learning of visual features. Uh, the paper discuss uh, the paper uh, works on extending the distance metric loss used in DYOL and SWAV to a semi-supervised setting, and uh, we have with us. Mido, and uh, I'll give you a short introduction about Mido. Mido is a researcher at Facebook AI and Mila Quebec AI Institute. Uh, he's been doing really great work and he's also served as a reviewer for numerous machine learning and machine learning and control conferences. And most recently, he was, uh, he was an expert reviewer for ICML. We'll be also asking you a lot about what is reviewing, how to be a great reviewer, and much more. Yeah. Uh, we look forward to your talk. Please start. Sure. Thank you. Sure. Thanks. Uh, okay. Yes. Yeah, so I'll get started. I mean, uh, yeah, I guess you you took care of the uh, the intro, so I, I really appreciate that. Uh, yeah. So this is, as I mentioned, uh, or sorry, as uh, has already been mentioned, uh, joint work um, with Facebook AI Research um, and my collaborators as well. Um, so it's Facebook AI Research, Mila, the Quebec Artificial Intelligence Institute, uh, at McGill University, and so this is. Uh, Work with my collaborators, Mathilde Caron, Ishan Mizra, Piotr Pozhenovsky, Armand Julien, Nicolas Ballas, and Mike Robat. And yeah, it's about semi supervised image classification in particular. Um, so the paper is available online. You presented this work at ICCV as an oral, and the code is also uh, completely open source and online to reproduce all the results in the paper. Uh, so feel free to check um, that out if you're interested. Yeah? Mido, the screen is getting cropped from the sides as soon as the recording starts. Can ah. you try sharing again? Uh, is it still cropped now? Yes. Really? Uh, okay. Where, where is it getting cropped from? From the uh, from both the sides. What about yeah, now? it's better now. Yeah, it's perfect. Better now? Okay. <laughs> okay, interesting. Okay, I'm going to be looking over here though. But <laughs> That's okay. Uh, okay, sure. So, yeah, we all know semi-supervised learning. You have a large set of unlabeled images and a small set of labeled images. Uh, and the goal is to learn representations that generalize to unseen examples by leveraging both the labeled and the unlabeled images. Okay. So existing approaches, one existing approach for semi-supervised learning is to do self-supervised pre-training followed by supervised fine-tuning. Okay. And so what this means during the self-supervised phase, you're only learning with unlabeled data. So it's a completely unsupervised pre-training phase. And then at the end, you're going to fine tune your model on the small amount of labeled examples that you actually do have. Okay, so this is one approach. It's called uh, self supervised pre training. And so, one very popular approach you might have heard of in the literature for self supervised pre training is the Sinclair method. This is um, from Google Brain, I believe. And so, how it works, um, and actually, if you understand this method, you kind of understand all the recent methods as well. They all kind of follow this basic principle. So you start from, you know, for example, an image of a dog, call that X. Okay. Can you see my, uh, my mouse as well? Yes, yes, the cursor yeah. is just... Okay, yeah. so you all, we start from, for example, an unlabeled image of a dog, call that X, and we're gonna generate two views of that image, okay? So these views can be generated using some kind of like data augmentation, such as cutout, Gaussian blur, crops, um, or combinations of them, okay? So we're going to generate two views of this image. We're going to feed those through our uh, encoder, which is a, a neural network, and then through a small little MLP. Um, and then we're going to end up with representations, um, ZI and ZJ. And because these representations actually originate from the same image, or will be different views of that image, we want those representations to be the same. So what the Sinclair loss does is it pushes together um, the two representations from the same image. Um, corresponding to the different views. Um, okay, but obviously if you do this, there is a trivial solution, right? You could just map all of your images, regardless of what their content is, to a constant vector, right? And you would satisfy this objective. So to prevent collapse, as they call it, uh, Simclear in particular uses something called negative sampling, uh, but there's lots of different ways in literature for dealing with collapse. So Simclear uses negative sampling, Suave, which is another paper they use kind of synchronous normalization, BYOL, which is, not, which is um, another recent method from DeepMind, for example, they have this kind of asymmetry between the, the two paths to kind of prevent collapse. Um, so point is, yeah, there's lots of different ways in literature for dealing with collapse, but 
most of the recent methods kind of follow this basic principle for self-supervised learning. <clears throat> and this is fully unsupervised, right? So let's just keep that in mind. So how does this compare to the, you know, to fully supervised learning, for instance? So here, um, we're training a ResNet 50 on ImageNet. Uh, these circles here are self-supervised methods that are trained um, in a fully unsupervised fashion on ImageNet and then fine-tuned on 10% of the ImageNet labels, okay? So imagine you only, out of all of ImageNet, only 128 images from each class are labeled. And then after your self-supervised pre-training, you're gonna fine-tune your model on those labels in just a regular supervised way. Okay, so that's what these circles are. Um, this point up here, this triangle, this is fully supervised learning with the same architecture using 100% of labels. So, I mean, you can see there has been great progress in the field, but there's still a gap, both in terms of accuracy between fully supervised learning with 100% of labels and self-supervised learning with, for example, 10% of labels. So there's a gap in accuracy. Uh, and also these methods use way more compute. I mean, like an order of magnitude more compute, for example, as you can see by the training box. Okay. So one other approach to do semi-supervised learning is to do kind of semi-supervised pre-training. So here during the pre-training phase, we're going to use both the labeled and the unlabeled data, okay? And then at the end, we're still going to fine tune our model on the small amount of labeled information that we have. And so the goal in our work in particular is to leverage advances in self-supervised learning while finding a way to incorporate the label information that we do have into the pre-training phase. Uh, someone just joined, okay. Uh, ways to incorporate the label information that we have during the pre-training phase. Okay, so that's kind of the motivation uh, of our work. Uh, and other methods such as label propagation and so on um, also leverage labels during pre-training. So we're not the first to do this, uh, but what we want to do is, like I said, build on the recent advances in self-supervised learning um, to develop a semi-supervised method. Uh, so in particular, we propose PAWS. PAWS stands for predicting view assignments with support samples, okay? And so I'm going to describe it really briefly. So, okay, we have two views of an unlabeled image. For example, in this case, two views of the same dog image, for instance. We're gonna call this the anchor view, and we're gonna call the other one the positive view. We're gonna feed both of those through our encoder F, and we're gonna generate representations. And then we're gonna generate class predictions for those images. And we're gonna call those you know, the prediction and the target, okay? And now, because those predictions technically correspond to um, uh, different views, but of the same image, right? These are the same image, just different data augmentations. We're going to say we want these two predictions, these two class predictions to be the same. So we're going to maximize the agreement there. Okay. So clearly you can see where the inspiration from recent self-supervised methods comes from. But the really interesting part is how we use the labeled information that we do have during the pre-training phase. Okay. So we also have this thing called the support set. So in each iteration, we're going to sample some unlabeled images, which are, and we're going to generate multiple views, right? So that's the anchor and the positive view. We're also going to sample a small set of labeled images, and we're going to call those our support samples. So for example, you know, here we sample a few images of dogs and cats and so on, and their labels. We do have their labels, okay? We're going to feed those through our encoder. So X here are the images, XS are the images. YS are their labels. YS are like the one hot labels for these images, okay? We're going to feed those images through our encoder ZS. Uh, and now, to generate a class prediction for our anchor Z, we're going to measure the similarity to the support samples. Okay, So this is just a weighted nearest neighbors. It's fully differentiable. So you just, uh, in short, this prediction here is just a weighted average of these labels YS, where the weight given to each YS is proportional to the cosine similarity between Z and the corresponding representation. Okay. So it's just literally, we're generating the prediction using weighted nearest neighbors with our labeled samples and it's fully differentiable. So at the end, when we compute a gradient, we're gonna differentiate both through the anchor path and through the support samples. So we're also getting gradients with respect to our labeled images, okay? Uh, and one kind of detail, I mentioned all these other self-supervised methods need some kind of way to prevent collapse. Here, um, what we do is we sharpen the targets. So after we generate a prediction, we sharpen it to make it a bit more pointy. Uh, and by doing that, that's actually sufficient to prevent collapse um, in our framework. Uh, but I'll go into more detail on that in a, on the next slide. Okay, but before doing that, um, first, 
let me just um, describe this nearest neighbors part because from an implementation point of view, uh, I just want to show it's actually very simple. So, right, if we call Z here, it's a d-dimensional vector. If this is our anchor representation, right, this is this vector here. Um, support representations, right, we have a batch of labeled images. So this is B by d-dimensional, our batches of size B. So we have B labeled images sampled in that iteration, and each representation is d-dimensional. And Y here, as I mentioned, these are one-hot labels for these support representations. So again, in a, if we sample B labeled images in each iteration, we have B labels, um, and if we have K classes, right? So this support labels um, matrix here is B by K, because as I mentioned, it's a one-hot vector, okay? Now, if you want to compute this prediction P for this anchor Z, all it is, it's literally just a matrix product, a softmax, and another matrix product, okay? So it's very efficient to implement. It's literally just two matrix products and a softmax. Uh, and as I mentioned, this is actually just weighted nearest neighbors. That's all it's doing. Right. It's measuring similarity to these labels, uh, to these um, sam uh, labeled representations, and generating the prediction in this way, non parametrically. So, by non parametric, I mean usually in a neural network, you have a layer at the end that generates class predictions. Right. Um, and so, this would be called parametric because you have parameters that actually define your classes in a sense. Here, um, we're generating class predictions non parametrically because we don't have parameters that generate the classes. We're generating the class predictions by measuring similarity to other labeled images. You see what I'm saying? <clears throat> so that's something interesting about the approach. And as I mentioned, uh, it's, uh, it doesn't collapse. So under these two assumptions, if when you sample labeled images, you sample them in a class balanced way. So what I mean by that is maybe first you sample a set of classes, and then you sample an equal number of images from each class. So if you do it in that way, it's called class balanced sampling. Um, and you sharpen the target. So as I mentioned, when you generate this target prediction, you sharpen it just to make it a bit more pointy. Uh, if you do those two things, you're guaranteed to avoid collapse. So you won't have collapsing solutions. If you're interested in the details, I'm happy to chat offline or I mean, feel free to check out the paper also if you're interested. Okay. <clears throat> For practitioners, uh, well, actually maybe before that, let me just describe the full loss, okay, in total with all the pieces. So as I mentioned, H here is, um, is like a cross entropy and H here is entropy, okay? So here we minimize the cross entropy between two views of the same image as I mentioned. And as I mentioned, we also always sharpen the targets. So rho here is a sharpening function. It just takes a probability PI and sharpens it with a temperature T, okay? So that's what rho is. As I mentioned, we just um, minimize the cross entropy of the predictions of the two views. So we wanna make those two Prediction is the same, right? So PI, PI plus, and then we just symmetrize it. We also compute the other way around. We use this one as a prediction and this one as a target, and we also, just to reuse the, and symmetrize the walls. And we average that over our batch. So if we have N unlabeled images in our batch, um, then we're just gonna average this whole thing over, uh, we're gonna sum over N here. So it's just the average. <clears throat> There's also an extra term here, and this is not necessary for the pause loss, but it does provide a decent boost in performance in the very, very low data regime, if you have like 12 images per class, um, this component here can be very helpful. <clears throat> we refer to this as the Mimax regularizer, uh, and I'll describe it in a second. So P bar here um, is just the average of all the sharpened predictions. So all the predictions we've made in our network across all the views, um, we're just gonna average them, and we're gonna call that P bar, okay? And now what we wanna do is maximize the entropy of P bar or equivalently minimize the negative entropy of P bar. Okay, and all this is saying is that the average prediction, oops, <laughs> the average prediction should be close to the uniform distribution. Okay, that's all this regularizer is saying. So it's taking um, uh, the mean prediction, taking its entropy and maximizing it. So we call that mean max regularizer. <laughs> so that's the overall loss. <clears throat> Sorry. Uh, yeah, that's the overall loss. Now, for those of you who are actually interested in, uh, so as I mentioned, the code is online, but for those of you interested in seeing kind of what it looks like in terms of code, um, here is some pseudocode. So this is not real code, this is pseudocode. But just to give a sense for like, what, what we're actually doing, maybe in a bit more detail. So first, we're gonna sample some unlabeled images. We're gonna generate two views of those unlabeled images. We'll call those XU1, XU2. And we're gonna feed those through our encoder F, 
and generate representations ZU1 and ZU2. Okay. Um, if there are any questions, also feel free to uh, ask. So I do have one question. Uh, sure. Although I'm not sure uh, how, uh, like it is a very neat question. When I um, read about the two assumptions, one of them is that the class should have equal number of samples, right? Like every class should have equal. So the continental learning soul inside me asks that what happens if it is not there? What do you mean it will collapse? What is uh, collapsing? So, but here, um, you don't need your data set to satisfy this. It's how you sample images. You, okay. you see what I mean? So your data set could be unbalanced, but it's when you sample images, you don't just sample uniformly. You first maybe subsample a set of classes, and then you sample an equal number of images from each class. Yeah. I understand. So for, uh, from an incoming stream of data, we can just uh, keep five, we can just wait till each class has five samples. Sure. Then, right. Uh, right. I get it. Thank you. Yeah. So if anyone yeah. else in the audience has a question, you can put it in the text or if you want to unmute yourself, you can just put that also. We'll let you unmute. Right. Please continue. Okay. Yeah, yeah, definitely feel un unmuting is good, I think, because uh, I, I won't be looking at the chat. Right. So uh, these are the new security measures that we have, we had to introduce. You you wouldn't uh, usually get this notification of people entering, but uh, okay. earlier, like, we would just let uh, anyone unmute themselves and we had some cyber bombing. Uh, so, oh, okay. yeah, we have completely removed that feature right now. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, uh, would, would you guys mind monitoring the chat in that case, just in case I don't see any... Uh, yes, 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 uh, we would questions. be. Yeah, okay. yeah, we will do that. Okay. okay, thanks. Yeah, so like I said, let me know if there are any other questions. Um, but yeah, so back to the pseudocode. So we just sample unlabeled images, generate two views, um, XU1 and XU2, and feed those through our encoder to generate representations ZU1 and ZU2. Uh, Next, we're going to sample our labeled support images. So I mentioned we do this in a class balanced way. So XS are the labeled support images, and YS are their actual labels. And we're going to feed those through our encoder as well, um, F, okay, to generate representations, ZS. So now we've sampled the unlabeled images, computed their representations. We've sampled the labeled images, computed their representations. Uh, next, we're going to do an all gather operation. So as I mentioned, when we generate a prediction for this anchor representation Z, we need to measure its similarity to all the labeled support representations, right? But if you're training on multiple GPUs, right, each GPU is gonna sample a different set of images, right? So what we need to do is gather these representations um, across all the GPUs. And so this sounds like it's expensive, but it's really not because we're not gathering images, we're gathering representations. And these representations are relatively low dimensional, right? So this step here just, gathers the representations computed at each GPU and distributes, its, uh, distributes it to all the GPUs. Okay. And then after doing that, we're just going to compute our loss. And then we're going to compute a backward pass. And then we're going to just average our gradients across all the GPUs just to actually leverage data parallel training. And that's pretty much it in a nutshell. Um, if you have any questions about this, feel free to ask. But also the code is available online if you're interested in using it and playing around with it. So if there aren't any other questions, I'm going to go kind of straight to, uh, oh yeah, and then we updated the weights, obviously. If there aren't any other questions, I'm going to go straight to describing some of the results. I okay. guess we yeah. can move on. Is there a question? No, none yet. No, no, okay. <clears throat> yeah, so in terms of results, uh, so here, for example, we train a ResNet 50 on ImageNet. In the figure on the left, we have access to 1% of labels. So 12 images per class out of all of ImageNet are labeled. And this figure on the right, um, we have 10% of labels. So 128 images per class roughly are labeled. Okay. So pause is shown in green. And these circles here are self-supervised methods. And these triangles are semi-supervised, other semi-supervised methods from literature that do semi-supervised pre-training. So for example, in the 1% setting, uh, you can see by leveraging the labeled information that we have during pre-training while building on recent advances in self-supervised learning, uh, PAUSE is getting much better performance while using significantly fewer training epochs. Okay. And similarly here on the, in the figure on the right, um, even with 10% labels, right, PAUSE is still getting much better performance while using um, significantly fewer pre-training epochs. 
even compared to other semi-supervised pre-training methods like MPL, fixed match, UDA. These are all from uh, Google Brain, I believe. Uh, need to double check that, but I, I think they are. Um, so yeah, getting pretty good performance, but just take this with a bit of a grain of salt because you can't directly compare one epoch of pause to one epoch of swab, for instance, right? Because we have the support set that we sample in each iteration of these labeled images. So one epoch of pause is actually slightly more expensive than one epoch of swab. And so next, um, we're gonna look at the actual training time. Now. So here's swab, if you train it for 800 epochs, okay, uh, using all the kind of tools, mixed precision training and so on, uh, it takes about 50 hours to run on 64 V100 GPUs. Okay. If you train pause for 100 epochs, it takes eight hours, uh, and it gives you an almost 10% boost in top one accuracy in the 1% setting, and also about a 4% boost in top one accuracy in the 10% setting. So, you know, the savings in pre-training epochs are also directly translating to savings in runtime as well, so computational savings as well. Um, we also tried increasing the model capacity, so seeing what happens if we train with bigger models. As expected, uh, you know, pause also benefits from larger architectures and so on. Uh, so that's pretty self-explanatory. I won't go too much into this. One thing I really did want to mention, though, uh, and this result is kind of buried in the appendix. So we don't really talk about it, but I wanted to take this opportunity to highlight it. It's how pause compares to fully supervised learning. Okay, so these dashed red lines correspond to a supervised baseline for each of these architectures. Okay, this is taken from the um, Sinclair paper, as I mentioned. Sinclair was the, the Google Brain paper from last year. Uh, so they compute some supervised baselines for these architectures. Uh, feel free to check out our paper for more details about these baselines. Uh, but so, you know, for ResNet 50, they're getting this performance. For ResNet 52X, this dashed line is getting even better performance. And for ResNet 54X, uh, the supervised baseline is getting you know, even better performance than the ResNet 52X and so on. And here we compare training with pause. So we train pause for either 100 epochs or 200 epochs. And we try training with either 1% labels in light gray or 10% labels in dark gray. And so one thing that I think is really cool is that pause, to the best of my knowledge, is the first method to, if you look at this figure here, the ResNet 52X, it's the first method that with only 10% of labels to match the performance of fully supervised learning on ImageNet. Okay. So for example, if you look here at this bar, training with pause for 200 epochs with 10% labels and a ResNet 52X um, is getting the same performance as fully supervised learning with 100% of labels. So it's matching performance with 10 times fewer labels using the same exact architecture. Okay. And similarly for ResNet 54X. Um, so one thing I will mention, again, also just take this result with a bit of a grain of salt because these supervised models are only trained for 90 epochs. And pause here, for example, is trained for either 100 or 200 epochs. So we're using more compute. Uh, but still, I don't think this result has been achieved before, and I think it's um, it's pretty exciting. Uh, okay, I mentioned we also do class balance sampling on the support set. Um, but, oh, is there a question? Um, I'm curious to know how the learned representations compare between supervised and self supervised techniques, especially considering the fact that PAWS computes reasonably well with fully supervised learning with so few labels. Uh, I'm wondering for the question, is there a particular um, uh, com like benchmark that you're interested in, in terms of the comparison between supervised representations um, and the uh, uh, self-supervised representations and the pause representations? Oh, yeah. Hi. So uh, what, hi. what I meant by uh, like uh, uh, representations was like <clears throat> similarity uh, metrics, right? Like uh, CK, uh, uh, like central kernel alignment. So that sort of stuff. So considering the- Wait, fact sorry, sorry, can you say that again? It's a little- uh, uh, yeah. yeah, sorry. So what I meant was uh, similarity metrics between the networks, uh, like uh, standard uh, kernel alignment, that sort of stuff. Because considering okay. the fact that, you know, pause use, uh, uses such less data, yet it competes relatively well. So like, mm. what's the difference in the quality of the representations? Yeah, we didn't we didn't look at uh, at those kinds of um, metrics. So if I understood correctly, you're talking about um, certain metrics to compare 
like two different neural networks, right? How aligned are the representations, for instance, and so on? Is this, yep. did I understand? Yeah, yeah, we, we didn't look at that. Um, it might be interesting to look at, actually. So we did release the models online in the GitHub, the pre-trained models. Um, so, I mean, if you are interested in looking at that, um, because we didn't, we didn't try that. Um, I think, but I think people probably have a lot of ideas that we didn't try. Uh, so I think, yeah, feel free to um, download the model from the GitHub and, and try this. Um, I, I will say though that maybe not specifically to pause, but in general, self-supervised methods that operate on this principle of learning with multiple views, right? So-called joint embedding architectures is what the common name for these kinds of architectures is. Um, for example, with something like vision transformers already, people are seeing very different behavior in terms of the, um, like if you look at the attention maps of a model, a self-supervised um, training for a vision transformer versus a fully supervised training of a vision transformer, and you look at where the model is paying attention in the image, okay? Um, you're seeing very different behavior between self-supervised pre-training with multiple views and fully supervised learning with the same exact architecture. Um, so there are, I think, not just quantitative differences in performance, like when you actually measure on a benchmark, but there are also maybe qualitative differences in what these representations are learning. Um, so uh, Mathilde um, and a few of the other co-authors on this paper, they have another paper called Dino that maybe you might have heard of. And there they talk about some of the emerging properties of self-supervised vision transformers that you don't get with supervised vision transformer. Um, yeah, so, uh, does that answer your question? Yeah, it answers. Yeah, sort of says thank you. So there are two more questions. Um, okay. I have asked the people to unmute themselves as well. Well, I'll read it out for you. So um, Laura asks that is it important to use the same classes in the training of the representation as in the prediction task afterwards? That's a very good question. So um, we, we didn't look at it in this paper, but I, I do have some insight about this that I'm happy to share. Uh, but it ha hasn't been tested. So my, my insight is that, okay, what, what, are, what are the cases where you see this kind of training on certain classes and testing on different classes? For instance, uh, things like Q-shot learning, for instance, right? Q-shot learning is one common application where you do this. Um, and in Q-shot learning, one common set of approaches um, are non-parametric methods. So methods that use a support set, right? So methods that generate predictions, not by having a fixed layer, but by measuring similarity to other labeled images. <clears throat> and so pause works in a similar way, right? We don't have a fixed layer, right? So technically we can see new classes that we've never seen before and still generate predictions for those classes, um, right? Even if, because we, we, don't require, um, we don't require a certain layer in the network to generate those predictions. We just measure the similarity to uh, other images, you know, um, to generate the prediction. So it's fully non-parametric. So in that sense, um, yeah, haven't tested it, but I think this kind of approach is actually very well suited for those kinds of problems um, where you want to test on classes you haven't seen before maybe. Right, uh, like in NLP, uh, it is very common to just generate embeddings and then use a cosine similarity for doing a few shot or zero shot based approach between the those embeddings to uh, classify them. Yes, it would right. be interesting. Mm -hmm. right. So there's another question from Salim. He's asking is the batch size yeah. same for the compared supervised versus pause when you compare the number of epochs? Uh, yeah, so we, we tried lots of different batch sizes with pause. Um, and actually I was gonna get into some of those relations. So the support set, the size of your support set that you sample in each iteration, that does make a difference in pause accuracy after 100 epochs. Maybe with longer training, it doesn't make a difference. I don't know. We haven't looked at that. We only did, did these ablations for 100 epochs. So the support set size for pause does matter. Uh, but in short, like uh, I'm going to see in a couple of slides, um, the actual batch size in pause, like the number of unlabeled images you sample in each iteration, this makes very little difference given a fixed support set. So as long as you just adjust your learning rate accordingly, um, you know, linear or square root scaling of your learning rate, uh, the batch size in pause does not really make a difference. 
Um, there's another question from Sankal. What happens when the labeled samples are from classes not represented in the unlabeled samples? Yeah, that's that's another um, really good question. Started exploring this a little bit, and so this isn't published during the paper. It also seems to be pretty robust to this, to be honest. Um, but it's pretty early, I think. Um, uh, but you know what? Actually, we do kind of explore this a little in the paper, and I'll tell you why. Because, for example, in ImageNet, there are a thousand classes. We're not going to sample, you know, images from all one thousand classes in each iteration, right? So we try, for example, even sampling like, you know, four hundred and forty images in each classes in each iteration, right? So in that case, it's very likely that you have unlabeled samples that are not represented by classes in your support. Um, and the method still kind of works reasonably well in this case. <clears throat> yeah. Um, yeah. Does, does um, that does answer? Yeah. Okay, it should because uh, <coughs> there's no response. So, yeah. Uh, okay. I guess, yeah, a lot of questions. We can move ahead. Okay, yeah. So, actually, just, just on this, uh, okay, perfect. <laughs> Yeah, so just on this point, um, I'm glad that answered the question. So uh, yeah, just on this point again, uh, I'll describe this ablation. So I mentioned we first sample a set of classes, and then we sample an equal number of images from each class in the support set. And so, and then we train for 100 epochs, okay. So this is our default setting here. Um, uh, let me just finish this and then I'll answer the question. Um, so this is our default setting here. We sample, for example, 960 classes uh, in each duration and seven images per class. Um, so it's a pretty large batch size, and this is the performance we get. Um, these bottom two rows here, we try um, uh, sampling, you know, a much smaller support set, okay? Um, and specifically, if you focus on these bottom two rows, um, the total number of images is almost the same, right? It's just in one case, we sample more classes and fewer images per class. And in the other case, we sample fewer classes, but more images per class. And in short, if you have kind of a fixed support set size that you can sample, it's better to sample more classes and a few images per class rather than the other way around. And maybe that's a bit intuitive. Um, okay, and to answer the question, how difficult would it be to use pause for regression? Um, it's a good question. I don't think... Hmm. Okay, I'll tell you what I'm thinking about right now. So in pause, let me go back a few slides. In pause, uh, well, maybe, okay, yeah, so this is the loss, right? We want to minimize the cross entropy across these two predictions, okay? And you could very easily replace this with like a mean squared error, right? It makes very little difference. I mean, you just need to maybe adjust like your hyperparameters if you're going to change the loss. But, you know, something like a mean squared error should work just as well as a cross entropy in this case. Um, okay. And we mentioned this Mimax regularizer, it's not really necessary. So we can ignore this for a second. <clears throat> so just looking at this consistency between the two views. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so we can replace this with a mean squared error. Um, now, the only thing you have to think about is the collapse, right? Because right now we're preventing collapse by sharpening the targets, okay? Um, and we're doing a softmax, right? So if you're not sharpening the targets anymore, right? Because I guess you could sharpen them if you have a continuous, uh, like if your output is not in the simplex, you could still sharpen. Um, yeah, point is, I think you could very easily extend pause to do regression, but you just need to think a little bit about how to prevent collapse because I'm not sure that sharpening makes sense if your output is no longer like in the range of, in the simplex, like zero to one, all the entries are between zero to one. I'm not sure that it makes a lot of sense in that case anymore, the sharpening. So that's just the only part that you would need to rethink a little bit. But as I mentioned, there are lots of tools already in literature for preventing collapse. Um, like you can add a sync horn operation here. Sync horn operation just, um, yeah, you can think of it as it just like renormalizes your target. Um, in a specific way and doing that should prevent collapse, for instance. So I think I think it is possible to do it, but it just needs a little bit of thought. You might need to tweak a couple things. 
uh, did that answer the question or should I, yeah. Yeah, okay. Okay. Yeah, so I talked about the support set. Uh, next, I'll talk about, I, I actually already mentioned this result, but I'm just gonna touch on it briefly again. Uh, we mentioned that if you have a fixed support set, so if you look at these top two rows, um, so if you sample roughly kind of a similar support set, um, if you change the batch size, for example, from 4,096 to 256, it doesn't really affect performance after 100 epochs. Um, okay, as long as you adjust your learning rate accordingly. Um, and so we train pause, for example, on eight V100 GPUs, so a you know, single, um, yeah, like a, a small, maybe not, I would call this maybe a small batch setting. Uh, and performance is still fine in this case, um, given a fixed support set. So support set size matters, but your actual batch size does not matter that much. <clears throat> Uh, is there a rule of thumb to scale learning rate with batch size? Yeah, we do, um, I think if I recall square root scaling. So if we decrease our batch size by a factor of N, we're gonna decrease our learning rate by a factor of square root N. Okay. That's kind of the rule of thumb that kind of works yet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And okay, we also tried longer training. So we, as you saw the results, we trained for hundred epochs or in some cases, 200 epochs. We tried also training for like 800 or 300 epochs um, with some of the models and it didn't provide much of a boost. So, I mean, it's good that pause is converging with such few epochs, uh, but ideally we'd like to see the benefits of longer training as well, which we're not getting right now. So this is maybe a bit of a limitation. Uh, okay, so in conclusion, we propose pause. Uh, pause is a very simple method for semi-supervised um, uh, learning of visual representations and specifically suited for image classification. And in particular, pause builds on recent advances in self-supervised learning while finding a way, you know, if you do have some labels available, finding a way to integrate those, um, that semantic information during the pre-training phase. And that not only provides significant computational savings, but also leads to much better um, representations for classification as well. Um, so as I mentioned, there are a couple limitations. I think it's important to also acknowledge the limitations of our work. So one is that using larger support mini batches uh, leads to better performance, right? We saw this. So, you know, the reason this is a limitation is because you, know, you need large support mini batches. So it makes it harder to train on fewer GPUs. Uh, I did mention though that we were able to train on eight GPUs and probably we can, you know, decrease it further if we decrease the batch size even further. Um, but yeah, the limitation is we do need large support sets to get good performance. Um, um, so that's something to figure out, I think. Uh, another limitation is that, as I mentioned, we don't really benefit much from longer training, uh, but actually, especially in the low shot setting. So if you have like 12 images per class, right, pause is a semi-supervised method. It directly uses that information during pre-training. Going for like 200 versus 300 epochs, it doesn't, you don't see many improvements. Um, so that's something to address, I think, because there's a lot of information contained in your unlabeled examples. And you should expect that, you know, if you have a very large data set, it doesn't matter how many unlabeled images you have, if you have a very large unlabeled data set that you should want to benefit from longer training. So that's something to address. Uh, in terms of future directions, I actually think it's, it's really exciting and interesting. Um, if you think of the support set as a kind of external memory, okay, then what pause is saying as a method uh, sorry is that two views of an unlabeled image should activate the same elements in memory okay um that's a really interesting concept i think it's quite different from existing self-supervised or semi-supervised approaches if you think of the support set as a kind of memory and so now future directions if you want to build on this are thinking of ways to build more flexible memory representations um, you know, maybe only incorporating instance supervision and support set and so on. But so I would think of the support set as a kind of um, uh, episodic memory. So humans, episodic memory in the context of, of humans are like memories uh, that are directly related to specific experiences that we have. And so you can think of the support set, I think, or I, I like to think of it as a kind of episodic memory. Um, and then what we're doing is we're classifying new images by comparing them to our episodic memory, seeing based on what we've seen, what is this image likely corresponding to? Um, and yeah, thinking of ways to build more flexible memory 
um, in different ways and so on. I think that's a really interesting direction. Um, and so, as I mentioned, the paper is online on archive. Um, we presented it at ICCD as an oral recently as well. Uh, and uh, the code is also available online um, in the Facebook research GitHub. And it's gotten some usage already, and uh, we're pretty responsive to questions people have and so on. So feel free to check it out if you're interested. Um, if ImageNet is too large of a scale for your setup, we also do some experiments with CIFAR 10 in the appendix. Um, so there are some one GPU experiments on CIFAR 10 as well. Um, and one last thing I didn't mention, but I, I, I think it's really worth mentioning is pause is very good at nearest neighbors classification as well. You don't necessarily have to train a linear layer on top. So when we're benchmarking on CIFAR 10, we're actually getting state-of-the-art performance using only nearest neighbors classification. Um, yeah, so that's, I think, pretty impressive because nearest neighbors usually is nowhere near as good as, uh, as, uh, as like something parametric. Um, and on ImageNet as well, if you train pause with 100% labels, um, nearest neighbors classification is getting the same as like a standard ResNet 50 trained in a fully supervised fashion. Um, if you train a linear layer on top of pause, so if you fine tune pause and train a linear layer afterwards, I mentioned we do this fine tuning phase. So if you do the fine tuning phase, you get a bigger boost in performance. But if you don't do the fine tuning phase and you just do nearest neighbors classification, you already get very good performance. Um, yeah, okay, so that's it. Thanks for uh, attending and happy to take any more questions if there are any. Right, uh, so the audience can put their questions in the chat box. And meanwhile, <clears throat> so there's this thing I missed in the introduction, and Imagine. I researched later on after reading uh, the Vanier Scholarship. Am I pronouncing it right? Yes, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it is awarded to only nine people in four years, and you got it. And like when I was looking at your record, you've got all four out of four GPAs or 3.9 yeah. out of four. <laughs> Super <laughs> impressive stuff. So, yeah. <laughs> I should um, actually acknowledge the, uh, yeah, actually, I, I should uh, take this opportunity to acknowledge the, the Venier Scholarship for supporting my, my research as well. It's a scholarship offered by the, uh, the government of Canada. And uh, yeah, so thank yeah. you, Venier Committee. <laughs> Right. Uh, and uh, so this is a very generic question, but I just can't resist asking if someone is starting with their graduate studies, you know, someone like me, uh, sure. what are your pointers? How do you manage mm -hmm. the course structure as well as research? Because the professor uh, expects research from you and there are courses that you can't yeah. skip. Uh, I would say at the start, don't worry about research. Um, focus on your courses. Uh, it's fine, you know, your first year to it's, I don't think you're expected to necessarily, if you want to work on research, go for it, but you might have a, a big course load. So your first year, I would say, don't feel pressured to do any research, just focus on your courses, um, learn as much as you can. Uh, and then after that, you know, you'll have your qualifying exam. So that's where after that, then they'll determine now you have the basic set of knowledge needed to do research in your area. Um, so after the first year is maybe when you start doing research um, unless you know but not everyone's like that you can start doing research during your first year if you want but I, I don't think it's an expectation necessarily and after that um, you know interests change so I would say during your PhD uh, explore a lot of different topics I would say and at the start it's you might feel some pressure to try and get publications and a lot of papers and so on um, nothing wrong with that but Definitely what's more valuable in your PhD is not to have a lot of publications, but a few impactful papers, I think. Um, and so, uh, but anyways, easier said than done, you know, and, uh, but I would say don't feel pressure. I mean, everyone's different, but maybe feel a little bit of pressure to publish, but don't, don't feel like even after your first year that now you just have to crank out a bunch of papers. Um, try to really work on something that you're passionate about and try, you know, working on something you think maybe the community is missing or um, there's a gap in some way that you think is interesting but maybe not a lot of people are working on or not as many people as uh, you know find kind of something interesting like that and uh, and then yeah you also collaborate be very open reach out to people and so on um, yeah. but, I mean I'm still figuring it out too so <laughs> yeah. so um, <clears throat> how long did your first publication take uh, my first one, well, I had started doing um, an internship before my PhD. 
so during that internship, we produced something that turned into a publication. Uh, so I believe it was published and I started my PhD in the fall and had a publication in, in January, but it was because I'd worked on it in the summer before my PhD. Um, and yeah, is this same advice applicable for prospective undergrads as well? Yeah, for undergrads, it's even harder, I would say. Um, so my experience doing research as an undergrad, I started doing um, like summer undergraduate research, and that's a good time to do it. Um, because, you know, you have undergrads have a very, very heavy course load, even more than graduate students. And so, um, yeah, I, I think doing it in the summer and so on seems reasonable, uh, but then maybe you're giving up internship opportunities. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. You know, it's a bit of a trade-off. Maybe get a mix of both just to see also for you what you're interested in. But I think summers are a great time to do research as an undergraduate student. You can try during the semester, but it, it might be tough, I think. Um, to do something meaningful, uh, unless you're not leading it. You know, maybe you're a, a collaborator and some graduate student is working on a project and maybe you're helping out with the code or something. And then maybe they got a publication, you're like second or third author or something. Uh, that's doable, I think, with a, with a course load, right? You're taking a little bit of time to help someone else who's leading a project. But to lead your own project with a full course load, um, yeah, that's maybe tough. Uh, unless you decrease your course load, maybe and you focus a bit more on research. Um, but yeah, I would say also undergrads and graduate studies don't feel like you need to, I think at least my impression was I felt when I was applying to graduate school, I needed to be like somewhat specialized in an area already to maximize my chances of getting in. I don't think that's the case. I think you just have to show that you're really passionate and interested. Um, it helps if you've done some research, but I don't think it's sort of requirement, but it definitely does help. And also if you, a big skill to learn is how to read research papers. Um, it seems easy later, but it's not as easy to start. And so just knowing, understanding how to read research papers, um, even that way, you know, when you message, uh, when you email a prof or something and you've looked at some of their papers, you can actually have a discussion about it. So I'd say that's maybe one of the most important skills, rather than producing a lot of high quality research as an undergrad or at the start of your graduate study. One of the most valuable skills first is figure out, like, understand how to actually read and understand a research paper, because it's, um, it is a skill that you have to learn, I think. Completely. I do agree with you. So I started computer vision talks in August because I was unable to read papers regularly. Mm -hmm. So I thought sure. it would be nice if the author is explaining the mathematical part to me and to you know other people who and then i started in august and by december i had mailed a prof uh, i had mailed a prof uh, that i read some of his paper i had some suggestions so when you were discussing a paper you kept keep getting things like this can be applied there also right. so yeah i had mailed him then i had one year of internship with him and then i had a funded phd with him so yeah it is. oh wow Perfect. That's yeah, really. you. Uh, you figured it out already. <laughs> so <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks to computer vision talks. Okay, so there's a question related to the mm -hmm. paper. I couldn't really understand how the approach is learning the negative samples, as in we are training the models to minimize cross entropy between the similar views. But then, how exactly is the model learning what not to learn? Yeah, that's a very good question, because in our case, um, in our model here we don't sample negative samples, right? So that's a very good question. How does it know what not to learn to prevent collapse? And the answer is in the support set, okay? So I mentioned we generate predictions, right? And we sharpen them. So these predictions are kind of peaky. Um, when you back propagate, like when this is your target, right? And you back propagate, what this means, actually, let, let me just describe the overall procedure. Imagine for a second that your network collapsed. And what I mean by that, imagine that for every image you fed it, it output the same thing, okay? So this is collapse. Uh, in that case, if you measure the similarity between your anchor view and your support samples, and then you put that through a softmax, um, right? It's gonna have the same similarity to all of these samples, right? It's not gonna prefer one over the other because they're all the same vector. So this here is gonna be the uniform distribution if you have collapse, right? But if you sharpen your target, such that it's not uniform, it's always like something sharp, right? Um, then you're always gonna have a gradient, right? Because uniform does not match something sharp, okay? So this is the intuition for why the method does not collapse. 
And now to answer like your intuition of where are these negative samples coming from, they're coming from the support set, right? So to prevent the uniform distribution here, these labeled support images have to actually correspond to different representations. You can't have all the images from the same class be the same representation. Otherwise, this is going to be uniform. Um, and But uniform is not a solution because we sharpen the targets. You see, so this is where the negatives are coming in. We're not actually sampling negative samples, but implicitly in the support, uh, we kind of have uh, negative samples almost, if, if this kind of makes sense. Does that answer the question or was that Feel free to ask if, if you need clarification about anything. I'm not sure if that was super clear. Um, yeah, to me it was. Sai, uh, would you like to uh, ask any questions or is the explanation clear to you? Yeah, if you, if you have any other follow-up, I, I might not have explained it super clearly. <clears throat> so uh, yeah, if you do have another question, I'm happy to uh, follow up. Okay. Uh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. There we go. Okay, till Sai gets back. Uh, so, okay, sort of has another question. Uh, does the performance of the technique depend on the choice of augmentation? If yes, then how does one select the representations without inducing inductive bias? Uh, yeah, so we use the same data augmentations as other self-supervised methods in the literature. So we didn't explore this too much ourselves, but I can tell you um, that the data augmentations do introduce a kind of inductive bias, but I, I don't think this is a bad thing. Um, <clears throat> so the data augmentations mostly that, that are used consist of some kind of color jittering, where you jitter the color of the image across the different channels and so on, uh, and random cropping, okay? Um, the random cropping is the one that's actually important. The color jittering is important to get things to work, but it's not necessarily important as an inductive bias. Um, and to explain this, Color jittering prevents the network from using um, the color statistics itself to determine what is the same image. Okay, you can imagine if you have, um, especially for convolutional networks, uh, but actually I think you see the same behavior with the ITs, um, vision transformers. So <clears throat> you can imagine if you have two different images um, and you just look at the statistics of their color channels, right? You don't focus on anything in the image, you just look at how much color there is in each channel, okay? So it's three dimensions, right? Um, just those three dimensions alone could be enough to discriminate between images. And so the color jittering is important to prevent the network from cheating in this kind of way. Uh, the really important augmentations are the cropping, okay? But cropping, I don't think is like, I think it's something very natural and lightweight. And right, you're saying like, you want the network to kind of match different views of the image together, right? You want it to be able to recognize that it's a dog, whether it's looking at this upper left corner or this bottom right corner and so on. Um, and, you know, not all of your crops are going to be of the same size. So the cropping for different views is really the important part. Um, it is an inductive bias that's specific to, um, to images, but I think it's very natural. You need some kind of inductive bias in the straight, like in NLP, for example, uh, Self-supervised methods, they do like a context prediction, right? They mask certain words and they try and predict the hidden word from the context. Um, in vision, you can think of a similar approach. What does this mean for images? It means like taking parts of an image and predicting other parts of the image from it. And um, actually, if you watched uh, Jan LeCun's uh, AAAI keynote in 2020, and I watched it and this was uh, very inspiring for me personally, um, I think these are kind of some of the ideas that he mentioned there, this idea of um, predicting parts from the whole and so on. It's using the data itself as supervision for your model, you see what I mean? Um, but it, it is an interesting question to think of other data augmentations um, and what kind of solutions those impose as well. Um, 
but yeah, we didn't personally look at it in this work. We just used standard ones from the literature. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, that's interesting. And the follow-up from Sai is a very long one. Uh, it says, so in approaches like PIRL and in general contrastive approaches uh, need a large number of negative samples compared to positive ones. That's why they adopt the memory bank kind of approaches. So does the support set provide adequate amount of negative samples to the approach to learn the negative set as well? Yeah, good question. Um, so yeah, methods like Perl, um, like you mentioned, they're contrasted. Um, they use negative sampling, similar to Simpere, for instance. Um, but Perl does predate Simpere. Um, and yeah, you're right. They need large, a large set of negative samples. Here, I would say we don't need as large a support set as those methods. And I'll tell you why. Because those methods, um, they give each, um, each image a unique label, right? Um, so methods like Perl, what they do, you can think of as like, uh, they give each image in the data set a unique class label. And then they say, um, push two views from the same class together and push views from different classes apart. Okay. And part of the reason they need very large mini batches, very large negative samples is because it's going to be very easy. Some images are very easy to discriminate between, whereas some are going to be hard. The ones that are hard are the ones that are giving you a big gradient signal. And so you need, um, yeah, you could maybe use a few negative samples if you do something called hard negative mining. So that's where you specifically look for very difficult examples in your data set and sample those. Uh, but as an alternative to hard negative mining, what you could do is just sample very large mini batches uh, for methods like Perl. Um, and because you have a very large mini batch, probably a few of those samples are going to be very hard. So you kind of get that um, for free. With pause, we don't have the same behavior um, because the support set is over classes. Okay, so we don't need to find hard negatives and so on. We just need the model to discriminate between classes, right? And so um, imagine, for example, right, we have one image here, the images in the support, even the ones from the same class, right? They're visually, they're going to look very different, right? Um, possibly, you know, they're not, it's not as easy as um, taking images from the same view and generating data augmentations, like images from the same class, uh, but different instances could look, you know, pretty different. And so already the fact that we're doing kind of this um, uh, like assignment, right, or nearest neighbors prediction with images that are very visually different means already we're getting a very large gradient signal without needing super large batch sizes. Um, the reason the support set size is important uh, and what's actually more important is the number of classes in the support, not necessarily the number of images per class. So I'd say that's more important. And maybe that touches to your question about the negatives. So whereas instance-based, instance discrimination approaches like Perl and Simpler and, and Mocha and so on, they need a large set of negative samples because the number of classes they have is equal to the number of images in the data set, right? So they need a very large set. Here, the number of uh, classes we have is actually just equal to the number of classes, right? So we have a much, um, I guess it's, it's a different discrimination task, right? So you can imagine if, um, if you're trying to sample one image from each class, it's much easier if your classes are actual real classes, you have a thousand classes rather than 1.2 million classes, right? So I would say maybe that's a bit of the difference. Right. OK. Um, so I hope that answers your question, Sai. Um, and there are no new questions. OK. OK, okay sort of, uh, okay, Sai gets it. Sort of ask, what, according to you, is the effect of self-supervised learning on model bias? As in, do you think that maybe certain classes are disproportionately affected? Um, Good question. So, okay, so just to clarify, is the question that you're asking whether self supervised learning has a different uh, effect on different classes in the data set? So, um, uh, yes, yeah, so like compared to uh, fully supervised, do you think that mm -hmm. it somehow disproportionately impacts because of the lack of, let's say, negative sample? Good question. Um, you know, I don't, 
I, I don't think so. I think if anything, supervised learning is more sensitive to maybe has more effect on the different classes than self-supervised because self-supervised doesn't actually use class information, whereas supervised does. Um, so in a sense, self-supervised, um, but I'm not saying it, it couldn't have an effect. Like imagine you have an unlabeled data set, but 90% of your images are dogs and like 5% are cats and 5% are like cars, right? Like you're going to learn visual representations mostly using images of dogs, right? Um, so, but because self-supervised learning is, you know, in a sense, task agnostic in the sense that we're not directly like, it's not like supervised learning where you're directly predicting ground truth label. The features that you learn from dogs might be very general and applied to cats um, and other types of images as well. So yes, I think like depending on your data distribution, right, you might have better representations for certain classes of images and so on, but because it's task agnostic in a sense, um, you would expect those features to kind of be general and, and work well across um, other classes as well, but to an extent, like I, I don't think it would be perfect, maybe better than supervised learning is my intuition. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, I hope that answers your question, sort of. Uh, till then I'll uh, read out Laura's question. From your explanation, could pause be more powerful on one task because it is less flexible than other contrastive tasks? Uh, I mean, because pause already concentrates on contrasting, contrasting specific classes and not the images itself as an instance discrimination. Yeah, um, good question. I think that's actually the intuition is we're performing better at discriminating between classes, right? Which is our downstream task, image classification. We're performing better because we're giving the network knowledge of this directly during the pre-training phase, right? We know that we have some classes that we care about and we have you know, a very small set of labeled images, but we do have a small set of labeled images nonetheless. And we're using this to inform the pre-training and make it more effective and aligned with our downstream task. And so, as you mentioned, the network is implicitly learning to discriminate between classes, right? And it doesn't have a lot of examples to do this, right? Like 12 images per class from ImageNet in the 1% setting, that's very few. Um, but it's able to use this information to do it reasonably well. Uh, and I think that actually hits kind of the, the nail on the head. That's, I would say, the intuition behind why it's performing better is um, we're incorporating the knowledge that we have about our task into the pre-training phase. And so we not only get better representations, but we're able to converge much, much faster. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. I hope that answers your question, Laura. There have okay, okay, another one. Uh, so many questions today. Okay. <laughs> if, um, yeah. Uh, sh can you uh, read it out, yeah, please? Uh, can I read it? I, I don't see it in front of me, actually. So okay, okay. So uh, Sai is just asking that there are a lot of questions which might take a lot of more time. So are you okay that he gets back, uh, he gets back to you with more questions and which platform would you prefer? Uh, yes, yeah, feel free. Um, email is best. I, I check my email more often okay. than not. My email is, um, I should have written it on the slide. I'll send it in the chat. Mm -hmm. uh, feel free to send any questions here at this email. Okay. Great. Uh, so, you know, do people in offline uh, poster sessions come and ask so many questions? Like, because I've just trended the online ones and there are there is not so much audience in the online ones. Yeah, so we, we had an oral at ICCV, right? And at a regular conference, this would have been, uh, it was still super exciting, don't get me wrong, but um, it's not the same experience, obviously. Uh, we did have a few people stop by. But um, anyways, I know I, yeah. It, it is what it is, I think, and with the situation, the way things are, it makes sense. I think that it was online, but um, yeah, no, it's not. I don't think it's the same experience. Um, but there are tools like GatherTown, for instance, if you've used GatherTown before. I think those create some natural organic interaction, which are nice. It's easy to just pop by and so on. Right. Um, yeah. Cute little minions moving. Uh, <laughs> okay. So uh, the last question is, uh, no, what does I ask? Oh, okay. I was going to ask something, I just saw a pop-up and I uh, forgot. No worries. Uh, probably if I remember, I'll pick you later. Uh, so yeah, those were the questions from my end. 
thank you so much yeah, for the talk. It was very interesting. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for all the questions as well and your interest. And uh, as I said, the resources are all available online. Like we try to really release everything. Oh, so yeah. if you do have any questions uh, and you want to play around with things, um, we're pretty responsive. Thanks. I will be reproducing uh, the paper for uh, CIFAR 10 and we'll be writing a blog on it by the end of oh, this sure. month, hopefully. Okay. 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 Yeah. Sounds good. Yeah, okay. Uh, uh, yeah. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was great. We look forward to even more interesting work from you. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.